The New News Festival, we like to take an optimistic and generally cheerful look at the state of journalism. We are optimists by preference and by nature. But I'm afraid this last session is going to be a sad one because we're talking about journalists at risk, journalists paying a high price for the work that they do. I should introduce myself. My name is Margaret Simons. I'm director of the Centre for Advancing Journalism, which has brought you the New News Festival in partnership with the Wheeler Centre and supported by Swinburne University. We're going to be talking about a couple of cases this afternoon of journalists at risk. Very shortly, it will be my honour to introduce the very brave man and woman who are sitting down in the front row here, Lois and Eurus Grest, and we'll be talking about the Grest case. But before we do that, I want to talk about the case, perhaps slightly less well known, of another journalist who's at risk, and this is somebody with whom I have a personal connection. When I started my career more than 30 years ago now at the Age newspaper, there was an editor of uh, a section of the Saturday paper and a sub-editor called Alan Morrison. And if I've achieved anything as a writer of non-fiction, I think it's largely due to his mentorship and guidance. Um, I think one of the best things he ever did was to cut the first three paragraphs of a story I wrote and make me start with the story rather than all the self-conscious twaddle at the beginning. And we didn't keep in touch, and we lost touch. But Alan went on and worked at News Limited, um, and then he moved first to CNN in Hong Kong, and then to Phuket in Thailand. And he started a web-based outlet called Phuket, PhuketOne.com, which I recommend you to follow. It needs your support in 2008, and he began by covering tourism and lifestyle stories. Um, but he's not the kind of man who would stick to that. And in 2009, with his local colleague, Trutima Sidassian, they started covering the plight of the Rohingya boat people and their treatment by the Thai military, and in particular, the pushbacks of those boat people. Now, as a result of that, Alan Morrison is now failing the possibility of jail in Thailand with his colleague. He would like to be here with us today, but unfortunately his passport has been taken away from him and his future is now very uncertain. Now I can't imagine what the Grest family is feeling about their son, but I can tell you that even having had a colleague relationship years ago and now knowing that that person at a time when we're sitting here safe and well in a building that's dedicated to free speech and to ideas, and to know that such a person is at risk simply for doing journalism, the thing we're all talking about, is in itself quite a searing experience. And I've asked, um, because he couldn't be here with us, I asked Alan and Shatima to make us a video in which they've answered some of the questions that I would be asking them if they were here on stage with us. I sincerely hope that next year, when we have the new news, we will have Alan Morrison and Peter Grest here in this space speaking to us in person. But for now, I'm afraid we will just have to play the video. It takes about 12 minutes. Picket One began as an old journalist idea of something to do in Phuket, Thailand. Um, the word one in Thai means both uh, day and, and, and also, um, what else does it mean? Sweet, to get everything sweet. sweet. So, so the concept was to do something that, that um, told the story of, of Phuket in the sense of um, appealing to tourists. Um, we began in 2008 and by 2009 we discovered that not everything was as sweet as it should be on Phuket. Uh, we began covering more serious news events uh, and, and one of those was the discovery of the huge numbers of Rohingya who came down in boats from Burma looking for sanctuary in Thailand or, or Malaysia and, and often being killed at sea or, or being abused by human traffickers on the way. Um, in 2009 we discovered that, that some of them were being captured by officials in Thailand and, and taken up to the border with Burma and then pushed back out to sea uh, without any, any form of power uh, so that several hundred uh, had drowned. 
Um, with the South China Morning Post newspaper, we, we broke this story and that was really the point at which international attention was attracted to the Rohingya story um, by, by Phuket One and the South China Morning Post. Um, on 17 of July 2013, that we republished the story from Reuters one paragraph to Phuket One website. And we heard that, that we've been shot on 16 of December in the same year. So we were shocked that the uh, police from VC police station rang me and then said, now you are being charged. So I've been discovered later that, wow, this is a Navy uh, charged uh, with the uh, defamation commuter crime act. That is uh, very disappointed that the uh, ministry used the bad law against the media rather call our website or writer or clarify themselves what happened, what's going on, but they shot out. It's a very serious offence. Uh, libel uh, and defamation in Australia are, are, are civil uh, affairs and, and usually resolved by, by talking about compensation in money terms in courts. Here, to be charged uh, with, with criminal defamation uh, and under the Computer Crimes Act means we could face lengthy periods in jail. And in Thailand, once police lay a charge, it's assumed that, that you're guilty. There is no presumption of innocence um, before you appear in court. And so it's really quite alarming to have uh, a military organisation suing the media in, in a country that purports to be a democracy. Reuters have done nothing. Uh, they've really left us to handle the problems associated with their paragraph. Uh, there was talk that, that Reuters were, was also going to be charged, but, but so far Reuters hasn't been charged. Uh, nor have any of the organisations within Thailand that also published the same paragraph. So we're really forced to defend ourselves uh, and to defend the Reuters paragraph when, when Reuters hasn't been called to account for the, legit the, the legitimacy of what we published. I feel very disappointed that Reuters, they protect their brand, not protect the people who are working for them. Actually, I am the fixer for Reuters as well when they're working on a Rohingya issue, but they just ignore me. So to me, they, why can't they stand for the principal thing on the uh, freedom of the media in Thailand? but didn't see anything much on, on that issue. Yes, I'm very, very disappointed what their reaction on this issue. We were in regular contact up until the point where we were charged, and from then there's been no real contact at all. Uh, I have to say that the, the journalism that, that Reuters do is terrific, and in fact uh, a series of articles that they did with Kunoi's help on, on the Rohingya won the Pulitzer Prize. So, I mean, that's great. We've always encouraged other organisations to cover the Rohingya story. Um, Kunoi recently worked with the New York Times and Al Jazeera, and she's previously worked with the BBC and Agence France Presse and many other organisations in helping them uh, to cover the issue. So we've got no, no problems with other people um, uh, coming into our territory, if you like, uh, and covering the story. It's an international story that deserves wider coverage than it's getting. Um, but for Reuters to behave as they have done is really unbecoming for Pulitzer Prize winners. It's an amazing experience actually for the journalists. The first time that I went there I feel very scared, very shocking what, what happened. But as a journalist people, we find out a lot of the story, what happened, what's going on inside. I stay with another nine women that who formed the jail as well. Not crowded, but they uh, not have any water, no, no food, no fan. Toilets is very tiny places, yes. So I've been talking to sharing the experience with another people in, in the cell as well. And uh, one of the women, she warned me, so please 
ignore all the jail much as you can because it's not a nice place to stay inside there. As part of the bail application, we had to spend the time that the court was sitting in the cells of the court. So when I went downstairs, uh, I had to surrender everything that might be dangerous, like a pen and paper. Uh, and, and I was put into a cell with about 30 other people, uh, all men, uh, many of them dressed in the garb that the prisoners from Phuket prison wear, which is uh, a beige coloured uniform and shackles. Uh, and um, I could only see one Westerner there, and, and so I introduced myself, and he turned out to be a Norwegian man who, who's been charged with killing his uh, Thai girlfriend. So we sat and talked for quite some time. Um, as we talked and as the hours pa passed, the cell filled up. So in the end, in quite a confined space, there were 90 men. Uh, and, and it was a, a disturbing experience. What, what was probably more disturbing was what he told me about life in jail, which, you know, um, given that that um, Phuket Prison is home to nearly 3,000 prisoners uh, and it was built to hold 750. You can imagine that conditions are not very good. He, he was in a dormitory with 300 other men and, and conditions are so tight that, that if they have to lie like sardines in a row at night and if one person wants to roll over, they all have to roll over. There isn't room for them to actually lie on their backs. So, no, that's pretty atrocious, and uh, prison in Thailand is not a desirable place to be. And we have to back to the court again on 18, 19, 20 March to the first trial to investigate on our business. So during this period, we're still waiting uh, the court back on that day. So um, the, the prosecutor has been preceding the court already, so we're still waiting, and then I'm not sure what happened, what's going on in the future, everything in the brew. So I would like to tell the ministry or Thai government, we are journalists, not the criminal people, so we are to do our job. I, I think it reflects particularly badly on on the current uh, military government of Thailand um, that this charge was, was laid. Uh, it was laid well before they took over and, and they themselves haven't done anything uh, this harsh, this harsh towards the media. So really, um, uh, there must be one or two people in the Royal Thai Navy who, who appear to be out to stop Phuket One uh, from reporting the, the, the story of the Rohingya, which is shameful, really. Uh, it's a story of international significance and, and Thailand, as a, as a would-be democracy, really needs to take the right kind of approach to the relationship between the media and, and the military. Well, actually, it's uh, a fact because of this, uh, as my experience that I've been, been intimidated from the, some local officer, the Navy here, you know. When we do something, no, you can't do this, you can't write this, because now it's a martial law, so we can call you in to our bed, report yourself immediately. So to me, it's very shameful that they, they intimidate the media like this, you know. So I would like to tell them, let us do our job. This is our right, our uh, right of the journalist to report what happened, what's going on, because many issues on Phuket are benefit for the public issue. So the people need to know what happened, what's going on, what you have been done in the past, or what in the future, what you're going to do for the people in Thailand or the residents who live in here. Your comments? Oh, look, I think that, that uh, we, we would hope that the, the generals in charge of Thailand at the moment see, see the sense in, in stopping this trial from proceeding. Uh, I mean, I mean it, it's just not a good look. And in fact, um, Phuket One was mentioned in the US State Department's Trafficking in Persons Report, uh, and the Trafficking in Persons Report lowered Thailand's status from Tier 2 to Tier 3, which is the lowest possible level. So sanctions could follow. Um, it's really important for uh, budding democracies to get these kinds of human rights issues uh, right and, and, and for Thailand to be treating journalists in this fashion is really not, not appropriate.
have no idea what's going to happen now. For We just hang out with the, uh, the martial law and the court case. That's unbelievable. That is, yes, of course, it's difficult, right? And they uh, interrupt our energy and then it's burn our time to do a very good story in many things. So I think it should not happen. So I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we end up in jail. Maybe not. It would be great to have uh, support from Australia. We've already had um, a reaction from my family and from my friends, and, and that's been wonderful. Uh, the more people who can respond, the better. Uh, any, any email or any letter delivered to the generals in Thailand or to the Australian Embassy in Canberra or uh, the consulate in Melbourne would, would be useful. We yeah, have very fantastic support from the people in Australia or other NGO around the world. That is very helpful. That thanks very much that they keep their eyes on us and they uh, follow what happened, what's going on. That is a big help. Thank you very much. Now I'd now like to invite um, Lois and Eurus Grest onto the stage and we'll have a talk about the Peter Grest case. While they're making their way to the stage, I would just like to say that for reasons which I'm sure will be clear to an intelligent audience such as this, we will not be indulging in any criticism of the Egyptian government or court system and nor will I accept any questions which are inviting criticism of the Egyptian government or court system, I'm sure. The reasons for that will be obvious to you all. Lois, uh, the Peter Grest case. Um, Award-winning foreign correspondent Peter Grest was arrested in Cairo on December the 29th last year. He'd been in Egypt only weeks, working on a short relief posting as a journalist for an international TV news network. And after a trial which att attracted worldwide attention, on June the 23rd this year, he was convicted of reporting false news and endangering Egypt's national security. He was sentenced to seven years in jail, and he remains today in Cairo's Torah prison. You have recent news from him, I think, Lois. How is he doing? Um, Peter's still remaining extremely strong. That's all I can say about it. You know, um, he, we saw him about a month ago, and um, uh, Eurus's brother is actually going in to see him again today. Uh, the visits are only for 50, uh, 45 minutes every 15 days, and I can tell you that 45 minutes is absolutely nothing, particularly when you've got to go through um, all the, the questions that he has for us and, and what we need to get from him details and all that sort of thing. But he, he um, is coping really, really well. We've talked a lot with him about, you know, what it was like to start off with when we've had the opportunity. Um, of, and he said that he realised at the start if he was going to survive prison, he would have to allow himself to give up all idea of control or have any, you know, thought of, of how to, to cope with things in, outside. He can only deal with what's inside in the, the present situation that he's in. And he's become very creative with that and um, sees, you know, the, the whole thing, not in one big parcel, of course, but as a day-to-day -day thing, coping with each day as it goes along. I can talk on more if you yes, want how, me to. Yes, how does he fill his days? Uh, ah. oh, sorry. Yours, you can never <laughs> get that. Well, um, at the, <laughs> I don't want to cut anybody short, but um, Peter's highly dependent on the knowledge that people outside the prison, especially back home, are interested, uh, are following the story, and are willing to help. That is a tremendously fortifying uh, idea that boosts anybody's resilience. 
Now, what that means in real terms is uh, even if it's just writing letters of support uh, to the people concerned, uh, Peter has received a tremendous number of letters from uh, the public literally around the world, seeing that he's had friends and, and colleagues elsewhere in the, in the world. Even if nothing else, uh, that gives him tremendous strength uh, to sustain his belief that uh, right will prevail and that this has to be seen through to the correct end. Uh, and in turn, it also strengthens us immensely, mm. knowing that Peter can cope, that mm. he is not buckling under, that he's able to, you know, uh, maintain his uh, balance, his uh, equilibrium, and uh, and make the best of the situation. So, where should people write, here? Well, um, in our case, um, people can write messages to freepetergrester.com. Um, at gmail.com. Mm. Uh, certainly, <laughs> yeah, certainly write to uh, the ambassador yes. and, and make, make noise, write to your, to your local uh, MP uh, and keep bugging them because it is easy, particularly in the context of what's happening elsewhere in the world today, it is very easy for these sorts of things to just disappear mm. completely. Yes. Yeah, I, I was going to just... Uh, urge you all to to write for Alan Morrison because um, that's uh, he obviously doesn't have as much support as Peter does um, out there and as it's not w as well known as Peter's case is. Um, but uh, you know we really believe um, that that has also helped to keep Peter safe. Mm. All the the writing to the ambassadors and and the noise that has been made about this mm. case in particular. Um, so um, I, I do think it's an extremely important point. Well, well, perhaps you could now take us through how you first heard that your son was in trouble. Did you know he was in Egypt? What was the first word that you had? Yeah, we knew he was in Egypt. He um, told us he was going. He went on the 13th of December. And then Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, we had a, a Skype call with him. And then Christmas Day, we had another Skype uh, a call. So um, we knew he was there. Um, we had actually on the 29th gone up to... Um, we have a little bush place in the country and Iris and I had gone up there and, and we didn't know that um, Al, Jazz, Al Jazeera were chasing us and trying to find us and through a long means um, Mike, our youngest son, found out um, that he'd been arrested. Um, so that's, we raced back of course to Brisbane and, and it's gone from there. But I think the whole family, you know, we were sort of expecting that it might be a, a day or a couple of days, not ever believing or that it would have got to this point. Mm. Now, your son's been doing dangerous work, important work, for a long while. Can you take us right back to his boyhood? How did his interest in journalism grow and, and what led to him getting into journalism? Um, do you want to take some of this? Or <laughs> <laughs> this is a mother's story. <laughs> um, well, he, he was an adventurous type of kid right from the start, but... Um, not, I wouldn't say he was overly adventurous, um, but he... Not a thrill seeker. No, and, um, but he always liked to try new things and in his growing up years he, he did rock climbing and abseiling and, and um, all that sort of stuff, loved bushwalking and, and camping, an outdoor type of... Um, growing up life. Mm. Um, he was also quite good at writing at an early age, I think. And um, so, uh, it, I don't know, one point where when he actually decided to, to do journalism, um, 
but um, the he did when he, he when he after he did his uh, journalism course, he um, worked in Shepparton and then to Darwin, and at one point he read um, Neil Davis's story um, written by Tim um, Bowden. Yes, mm. t Tim Bowden uh, called One Crowded Hour. And that really um, set his mind in, into going to, into being a foreign correspondent. And he took himself off to, to London when he was about 20, 23, 24, I think, um, and went into the BBC and said, I need a job. And they said, OK. <laughs> he was just one of those lucky <laughs> people. Um, he did producing for a while, and um, and then um, one night he rang us up and said, sit down, make certain you're sitting down, I'm going to Afghanistan. And, um, and what did you think? <laughs> we took a deep breath and said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in Afghanistan in 94, 95, when um, the Taliban came into Kabul. And it was a pretty tough time because there was bombs flying around all over the place. He was there for a year. So that was his start of being a foreign correspondent. And from there he went to Belgrade um, for the... Um, Yugoslav, um, Siberian, uh, Serbian, and um, that war um, to Mexico, um, where he covered Central America, um, and he arrived there, I think, just shortly before Hurricane Mitch, and that was a time when all the Nicaragua and Honduras and all that area there was absolutely full of mud and uh, it was a big story around the world. Then to Argentina and Chile um, and on to Africa. But Peter had been a Rotary Exchange student for a year in South Africa, so I think he probably fell in love with Africa mm. at one, that point. Um, but I, I guess if you want to hear some of the stories of Scare, um, one of the biggest stories that we, well, one of the biggest times we faced was um, uh, when he went into Somalia about eight years ago, I think. was. I'm not sure exactly when it was. Um, and we knew he'd gone in the day before, but... The next morning we turned the radio on to listen to the BBC reports um, and we heard that a journalist had been killed in Mogadishu. And at that time there were very few journalists in there. And that was when Kate Payton, the producer that he was with, she was shot in the back. And that was a pretty horrific time for us. I can imagine. Mm. I'm not going to ask you how many hours of sleep you've lost over the years, but I imagine there's also pride in your son. Eurus, would you like to talk about why this work that your son does is important? Well, um, Margaret, um, I might share with the audience my theory that I developed with Margaret in the green room, and that <laughs> is that uh, having a... Uh, an Eastern European uh, heritage, uh, it's probably some of, uh, uh, something in his genes that, uh, makes, that, that raises his interest in, uh, well, international relations and international politics. Um, uh, this conclusion, this hypothesis is uh, absolutely off the cuff, uh, <laughs> but uh, all of a sudden I believe that there may be some, some truth in that. Um, and that is that um, uh, anybody living in Eastern Europe, as also it applies in other parts of the world, uh, has to inherently uh, be on the lookout 
for what is happening, you know, among nations, what's, uh, what's going on. And you are a refugee from Latvia. And, and I'm a refugee mm. from, from Latvia. And um, without wanting to sidetrack uh, completely, uh, Margaret, mm. uh, I might also uh, tell the audience that one of the things that Peter's doing while in jail is that he is uh, starting a course uh, in international relations, a postgraduate course uh, assisted by Griffith University uh, in Queensland. Understandably, it's a, it's a slow process, but as Lois says, it's uh, part of Peter's uh, resilience and, and, and ways of, of coping that uh, when your freedoms are limited and, and highly prescribed, you know, it's one thing that, uh, that is possible mm. to do. Yes. Now you Even without the internet or a computer, so... It's all the long way. <laughs> <laughs> now, you and your whole family have been thrust into the public eye through this, and, and you're now between the family running Twitter accounts, running letter-writing campaigns, running blogs, and so on. And I guess one of the ironies of this is that you have until now not been in the public eye, and we now know your faces, you've been on television, and yet I feel that we don't know very much about you. What's your, what have your careers been and what, what have your pathways through life been? Would you like to start My pathway. yours? Yes. Mm. Well, I don't know, in, in some ways uh, almost as far from journalism as, as you could get. Mm. Uh, I started uh, my uh, working uh, career, working life uh, as an architect in private uh, practice um, for about uh, 20 odd years. Uh, then um, the, the winds of... Uh, Changing fate uh, blew me and the family uh, to Queensland, uh, where I took up uh, teaching of architecture. Uh, and uh, in subsequent years, uh, I, I have been deeply involved in, in teaching, in, in education, in the broadest sense uh, of the term. Um, my current interest uh, has been uh, in urban design, urban quality, um, the the physical and the social habitat that cities provide for um, 85, 90 percent of our community. Mm. And Lois? Yeah, um, I just might add, Eurus writes extremely well too, which is also part of Peter. Mm. <laughs> um, um, my career has generally been in social services, uh, relationship counselling, and um, I'm not nearly as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also coordinating in family daycare and a lot of childcare things. Um, I think, yes. uh, think some people might want to argue with you about whether that's less interesting, Lois. <laughs> <laughs> and your other sons, your other children, what, what do they do? Um, mm. Andrew's a farmer. Um, he um, manages a very large cotton farm. Um, and... Uh, uh, Mike is, um, he calls himself a, pub, you know, a public servant, but in actual fact he's um, in forensics, in scenes of crimes, in the police. And neither of them have had anything to do whatsoever with journalism up until, mm. you know, this present time. And I guess both you and myself are very, very proud of the way... Um, our boys have behaved and and um, fronted up to the media and mm. responded the way they have. And what's it like going to Cairo to see him <laughs> in those conditions? <laughs> um, Cairo itself is is um, not the easiest place from an Australian perspective. Um, it's hot. It was. They're in the 40 degree temperatures. Um, it's, to our minds, it's very dusty and, to my mind, quite dirty. People don't seem to care a lot about, they throw, you know, cups and, and glasses and, and bottles of water just in the, in the street anywhere. Um, so the rubbish is, is, is quite, um, quite large in places. Um, 
but it and it's an old city and and it's a third world country and and people are, are surviving it's it's not it's tough you know mm. for people to survive uh, there's a lot of poverty and mm. people out of jobs and the prison what's that like very scary from our perspective because there's a lot of there's tanks, right? Three love, very large tanks with um, their tar their um, barrels looking down at you as you arrive, and um, the prison itself is is very large, very, very large. It's about two kilometres. I think I, we didn't measure it, although we could have as we drove along to the the. Um, prison gate mm. um, and going through all the checks being uh, frisked down and having absolutely everything um, searched and looked at mm. it's just, it's not a very pleasant place to be there's a lot of people everybody takes food in for the inmates and there's, you've got a lot of bags to, to go through mm. the um, and Eurus, what are the next steps in Peter's case? What, what are, the, are the hopes that you have for the time ahead? Well, the next steps are aspects of the appeal. And uh, the appeal uh, really is a process rather than one single step. Uh, and the two initial steps in the appeals process are for the court, the so-called court of cassation, to... Uh, hear arguments about how the first the initial court case was conducted. In other words, it's to do with procedures of the first trial. Um, the Court of Cassation can come down with one of three findings. One is it can overturn the original case. Um, it can uphold the original finding, the original sentence, uh, or it can decide that the case deserves a retrial. Uh, that's where we are, mm -hmm. and, and, and we have not got yet to the first step, first stage of the appeals process. So do you have any idea as to how long those steps are going to take to play out, or when we can expect <laughs> more news? Um, Margaret, I, I don't want to inflate or, or overly colour it, uh, but truly, we really don't know. Mm. We don't know. It is, it is all a matter of guesswork. Uh, clearly, uh, we all hope and, uh, and, and anticipate that it should be sooner rather than later, but uh, we just don't know. Mm. The system is not able to inform us or guide us. How are you coping? How do you manage? Well, as... as um Eurus said before, um, because Peter's coping so well, you, we as parents, don't want to let him down. And, and in fact, I think the boys exactly feel exactly the same too. And so it's, it's, it's a circular thing. He doesn't want to let us down, and we don't want to let him down. So that's, that's one thing. But the support that we have had, as well as through what Peter gets is is what helps to maintain us as well. Mm. Um, it has been tremendous and uh, we can't thank people enough for that. Mm. Um, but it is an issue that um, uh, you could say is everybody's issue in a sense mm. um, because if we don't have free press, we're not going to be able to know what actually goes on in this world and that is vital. Mm. And Eurus, how do you get through the days? Well, much the same way, uh, Margaret. Uh, and, and, and dare I say also that some of these coping mechanisms and coping systems, I believe, are truly within each and all of us. Uh, when we are put to the test, you know, you find strengths and you find resilience and you find capabilities and talents that you never knew. And, uh, you know, without uh, singing the old um, um, 
song about always looking on the bright side. There are always positives out of uh, any dire situation. And, and one of those is that, uh, that you do find um, abilities that um, you, you never knew you had. Mm. And, and you draw upon those and, um, and battle on. Because, uh, um, again, to use another uh, cliche, when your back is against the wall, there's only one way to go, mm. and that's forward. Mm. Now, we have in the audience um, audience members, journalists, and student journalists, young would-be journalists. What would you say to them about this world of ours and the job that they're embarked upon? What would I say to them? Mm. Oh, well, um, okay. Um, I don't want to depart too far from uh, the agenda. No, no, uh, this is your invitation to but, do so. <laughs> um, it is in, in, in your interest as young journalists, uh, practicing journalists, as it is for the rest of the community, uh, and that is to demand higher standards of yourselves, uh, of your colleagues, and everybody that practices uh, your broad, broad craft. Um, I don't want to meander too far off the track, but um, sometimes I think that, that journalists and journalism uh, are their own, its own worst uh, enemy uh, in the sense that uh, why do we need Media Watch? Mm. Uh, my unscholarly belief is that, the, that Media Watch only covers the, the very, very tip uh, of the tip of the iceberg. And um, really, you know, uh, sometimes I'm, I cringe uh, mm. that Peter is a member of, of that journalistic uh, community. Mm. And so uh, I would say to you, uh, dedicate yourselves to raising the bar, the ethical bar, um, to use an old fashioned term, uh, the bar of propriety. You know, what is proper is, is something that we don't talk mm. about. Mm. Because I really think that, that one thing that, that could possibly, we can't guarantee that it will, but it could possibly uh, help to prevent cases like Peter's and Alan's is that journalism and journalists, those that, that, that do that kind of work, are held in much higher regard mm. and much higher esteem. Mm. And Margaret, permit me to make one other point, uh, and that is the other thing that everybody, I think, should work hard at is to make sure that the community, and when I say the community, I'm talking about the global community because we're, we're talking about an international, a global problem that the global community as a whole understands what journalism is about. I was shocked uh, and appalled to learn through our um, experience now nine months long that there are many leaders, many community leaders, uh, who truly do not understand what the role, what the responsibility of journalism or journalists is. Uh, in other words, uh, their belief is that journalism is um, the mouthpiece of the establishment or the, 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 the government in place at the time by another name. Now, if we can uh, help people to understand the role and place of, of journalists and journalism, uh, and that is to to advocate not so much for their own freedom to speak, but for the community's right to know, uh, then I think uh, everybody will benefit. Journalists will raise their standing. Uh, leadership, leaders will also hopefully come to understand uh, the role of uh, journalists and journalism and the work that journalists uh, do. Thank you very much for that. I am going to turn it to the audience for questions now. Do we have any questions? Uh, there's one right up the back there. 
Thank you to both of you for sharing your story and all strength to you. Uh, I, I imagine you've learned a lot about diplomacy and how it works and I'm wondering whether you can share any of that with us about what's been going on behind the scenes and above the surface on a diplomatic level to try and secure Peter's release. Mm. Um, yes, there has been a lot of um, diplomatic um, work going on um, and uh, we feel I guess it's 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 never ending really um, but um, as far as Peter's case is concerned and it, uh, we we have no argument with DFAT or um, any of, uh, actually the the Latvian embassy also has been um, involved in it too, because Peter actually has dual citizenship, um, and um, uh, both embassies have worked extremely hard. And that goes f for around the world. You know, we we know that um, uh, there has been a tremendous amount of work done. I can't share with you um, anything else on on that line. Um, I'm afraid. Mm. Mm. I'd like to add one general observation which might uh, sound like a piece of uh, wisdom but it's something that you know, I've extracted uh, uh, out of our experience myself and that is uh, clearly diplomatic work is important but while anybody is trying to kind of generate diplomatic activity uh, and, and influence uh, diplomacy in some way uh, we must not forget that in the end uh, the people that really control, uh, you know, that hold the, the jail keys are more interested and finally more influenced by domestic politics and their own power base than, uh, than external uh, influences. And that doesn't mean to say that we should uh, relent on the international diplomatic channels uh, but always remember that finally any politician uh, depends uh, for their strength and their position uh, on the electorate. Mm. So writing to politicians wouldn't hurt either. No. <laughs> Another question? Um, I just wonder, wondering uh, whether you can say a little bit more about his actual living conditions. I mean, Alan referred to 300 people in a cell... Um, and also maybe a little bit about his daily routine and things like that to give us a bit of a feeling for what his life is like. Sure. Mm. Um, he, Peter was in solitary confinement to start off with. I think he was, um, was about for a couple of weeks um, before he ever saw the light of day. Um, and, um, Incidentally, can I mention that this was even before the so-called charges were produced? Right, yes. Mm. And, you know, the, the comment by um, uh, Alan and, uh, I don't know... Shatima, yeah. Um, that, um, you know, you're guilty before you you're even go to court feels like that for us uh, with Peter. It felt like that right from the start. And particularly when the court cases started and we saw for the first time he was behind this cage and dressed in white. Um, anyway, going back to the question, he was then allowed out for four hours a day at that point. Um, but I don't, can't remember how long that lasted uh, before he got moved in with Bahe and Mohammed, the other two boys, uh, the Al Jazeera boys that were um, take, taken in at the same time. They had been in another area in the prison which was much harsher than where Peter was. Peter at least had a bed um, to lie on, whereas the other two boys were leaving us sleeping on concrete. Um, then when they got into the three, the three of them into the cell, uh, this 
this particular cell, they were only allowed out one hour a day. And that's what happens now. He's allowed out one hour a day. Um, the the um, space that they, the three boys had was two bunks on top, you know, a bunk on top of one and the, a, a bed. And there was just enough pa space for one of them to, to walk. Um, they couldn't pass each other. So the other two boys would generally have to be on, on the bed. Um, now he's in a cell where I think it ranges from five to about eight, depending on... I, I know that there was one stage where uh, someone was moved out um, to another part of the prison and another person was... Uh, he'd finished his sentence and I think he he had been a forger. But um, it, Peter says it's, it's, it's very limited in space and uh, when the cell is full it's, it's, it's pretty tight. I don't think it's anything like, you know, what Alan was talking about. He did tell us that he's put up a... a, a um, a towel so that he can have some form of privacy. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's tough, you know. I, I, I can't tell you much more than that. I don't, we don't know a lot of that, so the, the finer details of, of it. We knew the, the, um, about the, the previous cell when there was the three of them simply because he'd drawn a, a, a little map to show us um, what it was like, but this one he, he hasn't been able to, or hasn't done it. Um, what he does during his day is he he meditates for an hour when he wakes, and he did a meditation course um, about a year before he he actually this all happened. So that was very fortuitous, I think. Um, he says that it, it really helps to balance his mind. And um, he exercises, does about an hour of exercise in all sorts of ways. When they've had lockdown, they've been locked down for one period, went on for about six weeks. Um, he was using a, a step that he out of a box with bottles of water. Um, 1.5 litre bottles of water in his hand and he was pumping it up and down. He finds the exercise also useful to, to um, keep his mind, you know, a, in a solid place. He reads, he's allowed books and um, in the afternoons, he, that usually takes up most of the morning, in the afternoons he um, uh, teaches English to one guy and that guy teaches him Arabic. But now he's got the uni course, we've got the uni course going, and um, so he's reasonably well occupied. He's got, you know, an intellectual mm -hmm. capacity with the, the uni course. Mm -hmm. And he's managed to dig a, a little herb garden. <laughs> <laughs> He's found a spot and he asked for permission and he's been given permission to plant these herbs and um, be told that he can go and water it once a day. So. You raised a strong man. Hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Um, we heard in the, um, in the video interview about Reuters' um, lack of support um, uh, for your colleague, I was wondering how Al Jazeera supported Peter in uh, Egypt. How have Al Jazeera been? Well, we have had very solid support from Al Jazeera. Uh, we really uh, have all praise for uh, their acceptance of their ethical and, and moral responsibility uh, for where Peter is. Um, obviously, 
there's only so much that that any uh, non-government agency, uh, be it a major international news agency, uh, can do. Uh, but um, uh, Al Jazeera have been very, very supportive and uh, and very active in the case uh, from day one. Mm -hmm. That's very good to hear. Indeed. Yeah. We had another question here. Um, Telling the truth is both a risk and yet a need. Through Peter's experience, if you had a message to share with other journalists, what would that be? Oh dear, what would that message be? Well, keep telling the truth. Mm. I think Definitely. that that's, uh, that's the only way, you know. Um, shying away from pursuing uh, truth and, and telling the story the way you see it, I think is the only way that, um, that we can uh, deal with situations uh, like that, hard and, and painful uh, as it is. But um, I, I don't think that uh, we, can, we can take any other direction. You know, I, I can't help but um, recall the, 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 the saying um, attributed to who knows who, uh, that uh, evil happens when, you know, when good people do nothing. And, uh, and if we uh, ease up on our endeavours to, uh, well, pursue the truth or uh, support the community's right to know what is happening, uh, more and more evil will take place and, and, and we will just, you know, open up the door uh, for more of these sorts of things uh, to happen. Uh, that, uh, that we are lamenting here this afternoon. Can I just add one more point too? Um, Peter, I think, um, wrote uh, some letters from prison that were smuggled out in the first few weeks. Um, and they're on the, the web page that we have. It's called freepetergrester.org. Um, I think there's about four or five letters that he's written, one more recently. Um, but he, he does talk a bit about the integrity, uh, keeping your integrity, um, and I think that's part of telling the truth. Mm. We'll give that address again at Thank the end you. of the session. Um, another question? Look, my question's actually asked already, but it did occur to me, in his current situation, studying international relationships as he is, what is Peter's dream for when this all finally resolves and he has his freedom again? <laughs> I think that's a question that Peter himself can't answer. He doesn't know. Um, we have talked to him about it, but he, he um, I think he'll probably write a book. It'll be one of the things. Um, mm. But uh, I think he... he I think he'd um, still probably like to do some um, correspondent, you know, foreign correspondent work, but perhaps in a limited way. I mean, he's not a, dare I say it, he probably will kill me for saying this, but he's not a young man anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, being a foreign correspondent is a hard job, you know, you um, physically as well as, um, yeah, physically demanding and um but emotionally <coughs> mentally psychologically it is very demanding very draining yeah mm. and uh, as i think i might have mentioned uh, earlier here or um, in discussions with margaret um, it might be too obvious to say this but experiences like that for the whole family peter and the whole extended family you know including my brother are truly life-changing mm. So we do not know what will happen when this is all over. You know, hopefully uh, before the year turns, hopefully before Christmas. Um, <laughs> heaven forbid that it goes on for another year or so. But, uh, but we will all be very different people at the end. And, uh, and who knows uh, where we'll want to go from there. Mm. Well, I know that you have the wishes of the entire audience with you and the audience that will be following the Twitter stream, the reports on The Citizen, and eventually the video when we make it publicly available, which we'll do as soon as we can. 
In the meantime, I should say that uh, Phuket Tuan is still reporting on the Rohingya problem. In fact, their latest report was just published earlier today. Uh, mm -hmm. You can follow that on phuketwan.com. You can also follow them on Twitter, and I'd encourage you to do so. And I'd invite you to give again the addresses of the Twitter account and blog that um, people can follow this case on. Do you know their Twitter account? I think it's just... Free Peter Grester. Free Peter Grester. Mm. They're all Free yeah. Peter Grester. Um, mm. There's the Gmail account to write letters, um, Free Peter Grester dot, um, Free Peter Grester, Gmail, at Gmail, isn't it? Yes. Um, mm. dot com. Dot com. Um, and uh, there's the web page, uh, Free Peter Grester dot org. Mm. And there's Facebook, which is also Free Peter Grester. Mm. And uh, all the, uh, the, the web page we need to update um, a bit more regularly and I'm afraid we're not doing it as much as we should be but mm. um, there are some interesting letters on it if you go into the letters part of mm. the web page. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing and in particular anything that the people here listening to you can do to help? I think we've covered most areas where people can help. Um, obviously, uh, sooner or later, um, when it comes to legal defense that has to be funded somehow, um, there'll be time to support Alan and Peter and anybody else uh, materially. But I think for the time being, the most important thing is to uh, explore all the possibilities of giving them moral and psychological and, mm -hmm. and emotional uh, support uh, mm -hmm. to be able to last the distance, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Yeah, Lois? Um, yes, I'd just like to say that too. The, the distance is something that we don't know and um, um, if it has to last for the seven years... Um, don't even think of we're it. We're not, yes, we're not going down that road. But, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, being optimistic, we would like to think that he's out before Christmas. But as the Egyptians would say, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good note to finish on. Um, well, I would say that uh, we do hope that when we have the new news next year, we will have your son here with us. Um, and certainly he will be in all of our thoughts and our tweets until then. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you both very much for your courage and your strength and your belief in journalism and for being here today. And I'd like to say the same to the audience. Thank you for being here today. Please join us next year at the New News. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. <laughs>